Hello, and welcome to our virtual session of the utility of the NVIDIA genomic classifier in multidisciplinary ILD management. I'm Lisa Lancaster, a professor of medicine in the Division of Allergy, Pulmonary, and Critical Care Medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And I'm delighted to have my esteemed colleagues here with me um, to talk about the diagnosis management and strategies to make the diagnosis um, here today. And I'd like to thank Dr. David Lynch, Professor of Radiology from National Jewish Health, and Dr. Thomas Colby, Emeritus Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology from the Mayo Clinic. David, Tom, thank you so much for being here. We're delighted to have you. You both are just the world experts in this area. So it couldn't be uh, better people to have in the discussion. So thank you. We wanna go over our learning objectives and those include the following. We wanna understand the challenges to making an early and accurate diagnosis in interstitial lung disease, especially fibrotic lung disease. We wanna review the latest published information on the clinical validation and utility of a new tool in the diagnosis of fibrotic lung disease and that's the Invisia genomic classifier. We also want to understand where the role of that classifier may be helpful in diagnosis and prognosis of the patient with ILD and understand uh, how that came to be. What was the background of the development of that Invisia classifier and what studies came to make that happen? So we're going to be talking about that. But we know that an accurate diagnosis is important and imperative. And really, we first began to learn that with the PANTHER trial and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis from the IPF network studies. And we learned there that immunosuppressive therapy with imurin and prednisone in that group of people that were uh, in that arm of the study was actually harmful. And that arm of the study was stopped early as a cause. But we know people who have connective tissue disease benefit from treating the systemic underlying connective tissue disease, and that includes immunosuppressive therapy for them. In patients who have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we're, wanna get, we're gonna wanna diagnose that early and get them started on antifibrotics early so that we can preserve lung function and slow disease progression as long as possible. Understanding whether or not a patient has usual interstitial pneumonitis is critical as well, too, because that's that defining injury pattern for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But it's also a defining injury pattern that we can see in autoimmune disease, drug toxicity, and certain environmental exposures. So incorporating that injury pattern into the full history, physical exam, and all the other clues that we collect and gather are, uh, is very important in defining the diagnosis and ultimate management for that individual patient. We also know that the usual interstitial pneumonitis pattern is associated with a poor prognosis, regardless of the interstitial lung disease. And you can see here that survival is worse for patients who have a UIP pattern with rheumatoid arthritis interstitial lung disease in comparison to other connective tissue disease ILDs such as an NSIP pattern. And in patients who have hypersensitivity pneumonitis uh, with fibrosis versus no fibrosis, with those having fibrosis having a worse survival. So let's look at another tool called the Invisia classifier. Let's, let's do a brief overview and look at that background clinical data that led to its approval. So what exactly does the Invisia genomic classifier do? Well, it detects a genomic pattern of usual interstitial pneumonitis by using transbronchial biopsy samples. So transbronchial biopsy samples are collected just as you normally do during a routine bronchoscopy. Then they're dropped in their little tubes, mailed back, and then processed. And ultimately, from an RNA that's pooled from that transbronchial biopsy sample, a single whole transcriptome library is developed and ultimately generated in sequence. And what that gives you is an injury pattern 
of actively transcribing genes or an injury pattern of gene expression. That's then compared to the locked Invisia classifier and designated as either positive or negative for a molecular pattern of usual interstitial pneumonitis. So I want you to think about this kind of like we think about an injury pattern on uh, radiologic imaging on high risk CTs, an injury pattern on biopsy, that's a pathologic injury pattern. This is more of a genomic expression injury pattern and yet another clue that we can use to identify UIP. So how was that figured out? Well, that was a, figured out through the BRAVE trial, and that was a prospective 30 U.S. and European multi-center study that ultimately led to the development and the clinical validation of the Invisia genomic classifier with 447 patients enrolled in this study. And there were three different arms. And uh, these were all patients who were already undergoing a clinical evaluation for interstitial lung disease, and they required a tissue biopsy. So one arm had patients who were getting a surgical lung biopsy, one arm had patients who were getting a bronchoscopy, and one arm had patients who were getting a cryobiopsy, with all arms collecting transbronchial biopsies. The pathology was review reviewed centrally by expert pathologists, and the radiology was reviewed centrally by expert uh, radiologists. And they all came together with expert pulmonologists in a multidisciplinary conference to understand the diagnosis. Two independent prospective clinical validation studies then uh, resulted in validating that classifier. So again, UIP by the surgical lung biopsy is that truth label for helping identify that genomic expression injury pattern for usual interstitial pneumonitis. From this collection of patients who were in the BRAVE trial, it actually represented a very diverse collection of interstitial lung disease patients, some with UIP and some with non-UIP. And those non-UIP patients were mostly made up of respiratory bronchiolitis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, sarcoidosis, and NSIP. Those that we commonly see and that we're trying to um, tease out diagnoses uh, from IPF in clinic. In those two independent prospective clinical validation studies, the Invisia classifier identified UIP with a combined 91% specificity and 63% sensitivity compared to the histopathology. So if you look at the histograms here, you'll see that in the initial validation study, it was and in, in gray, in the second validation study in the light green, uh, both were very comparable to each other with that specificity of 91% and sensitivity of 63%, resulting in a very low false positive rate for the classifier. So think of this as an additional tool. All the clues that we get from clinical history, exposure history, uh, past medical history, coordinated with rheumatologic review systems, a good physical exam, uh, injury pattern on high resolution CT in, uh, in total with the Invisia genomic classifier, all being clues together that we can discuss at our multidisciplinary discussions to ultimately come up with a more confident diagnosis uh, of ILD. So let's start by looking at our multidisciplinary uh, cases that we have to discuss. And I'm excited to bring uh, uh, Dr. Colby and Dr. Lynch now uh, into the discussion as we review these cases. So we'll start with our first case. And uh, this is a 71-year-old male. He's Caucasian. He's a non-smoker. And he presents with a history of shortness of breath and cough for about three months duration. His past medical history was notable for diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and coronary artery disease. So all comorbidities that we can see with fibrotic lung disease. Medications include aspirin, uh, clopidogrel, uh, bispropyl, uh, candesartan, simvastatin, 
so medicines that we'd see with these past medical history, but nothing really stands out as particularly toxic. The occupational history for this gentleman included an exposure of some type to asbestos for about 49 years, uh, with the last exposure being 17 years prior to presentation. And we're unclear of the etiology uh, of this. Um, as an aside, all of this information in these cases come to us uh, complements of the BRAVE study. So we may not have uh, uh, as many clues as we would have necessarily in clinic. Hobbies for this patient um, and exposures included mold or mildew in the home with uh, a current uh, history with a 10 year past exposure history as well. Interestingly enough, uh, this patient had an Australian parakeet in the past. And Tom, I think you know the name of what this bird is uh, from the past, if I remember correctly. In, in the UK, they call them budger agars, budgies. <laughs> I'm glad you remember that. That's an interesting random bit, bit of uh, knowledge you, you carry there. Um, family history was notable for familial pulmonary fibrosis and uh, chronic, with no familial pulmonary fibrosis and no chronic lung disease. So let's look at his pulmonary function testing in serologies. He had an FEV1 to FEC ratio of 94% with an FEC 67% of predicted and an FEV1 85% of predicted. Uh, total lung capacity was more severely reduced and DLCO uh, was more severely reduced at 49.6% of predicted. He completed a six minute walk test and walked 265 meters on two liters of oxygen. And his oxygen saturations decreased from 93% to 76% on his two liter nasal chemo. So this wasn't exactly covered well with that two liters. Autoimmune serologies that were done were really unremarkable and a CRP was slightly elevated at 14.6 with the upper limits of normal on this panel being 10. So let's look at the HRCT scan and I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Lynch to go through the elements and the findings of the HRCT. So uh, here's the high resolution chest CT. And uh, you will remember that when we're looking at high res CT in general, we need to look at the technique. We also need to look at the pattern of abnormality and importantly, the distribution of abnormality to come up uh, to with a way to fit the, these patterns of fibrotic lung disease within the rubric of the ATS Inflation and Society classification. So that's what we're going to do here. Um, I think the first thing to note actually is that if you look down here on the left side, it's, it's, this is slightly thicker than we usually see. It's two millimeters. We like to see something a little thinner than that, but I, I don't think it makes any practical difference in this case. Um, so when we start at the top here, we see that the image is abnormal and there is ground glass and fine reticular abnormality. And those abnormalities persist throughout the scan. Uh, there is, uh, and you can see that the ground glass actually is quite prominent, but you'll notice also that the ground glass is associated with substantial traction bronchiectasis. There's also some mediastinal adenopathy here that I don't know that we ever figured out why that was, but it's really not relevant to this case, I think. Um, so, and as we go down through the remainder of the scan, uh, you'll see that the pattern is consistent. It's a, this combination of ground glass abnormality with substantial traction bronchiectasis, indicating that this ground glass is probably fibrotic. Um, and it shows slight lower lung predominance. The next thing we're going to look at is, are the coronal images because that's often helpful in deciding on the distribution of disease. And so when we look at the coronal images, you get that overall picture again of ground glass abnormality with traction bronchiectasis. Uh, and uh, you can see that there is a lower lung predominance. There's also scattered areas of mo mosaic attenuation. 
Uh, so we would have liked to have seen expertry images, which we do, don't have. This, that's the, you know, the perils of a retrospective study. Uh, however, I'm not sure that either of these technical limitations makes any difference to this particular case. So this, to go through, you know, the categories of definite UIP, probable UIP, indeterminate, or suggestive of an alternative diagnosis. This does not meet criteria for definite or probable UIP because there's too much central involvement and there's too much ground glass abnormality. However, it really does not meet criteria for the uh, for a specific alternative diagnosis. If there was an alternative diagnosis, I think we would consider most strongly NSIP. Uh, or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So that's exactly why we created uh, this indeterminate category of abnormality to include patients like this where we just don't know. Uh, and the interesting thing is in two large series, uh, when we have an indeterminate pattern like this, uh, it's about 50-50 whether the patient has UIP or some alternative diagnosis. So, it's a coin flip, so uh, I think it, therefore it goes back to the clinician to decide on the next step. Lisa, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I think that I think you covered that quite well. And it, and as we look at the images and we think about uh, what the possibilities are, we are left with. Uh, either uh, nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, uh, fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, could possibly still be IPF. Um, although we don't have clues of connective tissue disease ILD, I suppose it's still a possibility. Or are we unclassifiable at this point? And when we think about the case in total, we have a 79-year-old male three month history of cough and shortness of breath. There was exposure to asbestos mold and the Australian parakeet. We have those indeterminate uh, characteristics that you noted with some findings may be suggestive of NSIP and HP, maybe a UIP. So it, I think it's challenging for us to really uh, delineate it, but I want everybody to to think that's watching about what the possible options are, what they're leaning toward now. Um, uh, Dr. Lynch, do you have uh, any particular leanings? And then um, Dr. Colby, I'll ask you next. Yeah, I think in this case, given that central predominance, I probably would lean towards NSIP um, uh, just because those findings are, and the extensive ground glass, those findings are a bit unusual for either of the other two diagnoses, but certainly we could see that with chronic HP as well. I, I don't really have any comments that this is David's area of expertise. Mm -hmm. For what it's worth. <laughs> so I think in looking at this case, as we um, uh, try to make our decision about what the possibilities are, I think that ends up leaving us with and uh, unclassifiable category with um, a low level of confidence. How do you all feel about that? Yeah, I think so. You, you have a couple of exposures that are questionable. Uh, you know, the, the and, oh, and by the way, there was the asbestos exposure. I forgot to mention that, but we did not see any uh, pleural plaques. So I think that would be unlikely you know, to have this extensive fibrosis without uh, the presence of any calcified or non-calcified plaques. Right, right. So, it, I mean, in general, if possible, we need some more clues to be able to make the diagnosis. So we're gonna think about what we want to do next. So let's look at some options of what you do next. So I want everybody who's watching to think about what those possible options are. And I think some of those options are flavored by um, where we are. Uh, wh what procedures can we best handle in our own institution? Uh, and, and I'm very interested, uh, Dr. Colby, to hear from you on your thoughts on the utility
of cryobiopsy, the size of samples that you're getting and you're seeing in comparison to um, a vaccine lung biopsy? Well, the, the cryobiopsies are very uh, site dependent and operator dependent. And at experienced sites with experienced operators, we get pieces of tissue that are well over half a centimeter in size. And as such, uh, 80 to 90 percent of those are going to allow a histologic pattern recognition. Obviously, they're not as good as a surgical lung biopsy, but it's very operator dependent. But I, my own opinion is that cryobiopsy is a useful technique that is often helpful in management. And I think it really, like you said, depends on um, uh, the operator and then the protocol. I know that they're trying to uh, fine tune those and standardize those more um, uh, across uh, institutions and even across countries. So let's look at what was done and get our next set of clues. So the patient actually had a bronchial velar lavage and had the invisia genomic classifier perform. So on the BAL, we saw 2% lymphocytes, 3% neutrophils, 12% eosinophils, and 82% macrophages. Uh, and you can uh, see comparison to the normals that you're, you're, you're used to looking at every day. The Invisia genomic classifier actually did give us a result that was positive for usual interstitial pneumonitis. And um, looking at that and looking at the um, more EOs, but normal max and uh, no disparate lymphocytes or neutrophils with the UIP genomic injury pattern, I think that puts us in more of a category of a uh, UIP, IPF, or a hypersensitivity pneumonitis with these uh, more unusual features on the CT scan. And with a little bit of almost mosaicism on the CT and findings on the CT, I, I think I'm leaning more toward a uh, uh, fibrotic HP. Um, and I, I'm interested uh, in uh, what you guys think about that. Yeah, that would certainly be consistent with, you know, the small amounts of mosaic attenuation that we saw. Um, and, uh, and obviously with, with your exposures are probably really driving your, your um, thoughts here. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, the exposures are hard to completely let go of, particularly when you've got a CT scan that does include chronic HP in the differential. What do you think about the utility of the classifier uh, in this at this point in this particular case? How does that change your confidence level in the diagnosis? To me, it tells me he has a significant fibrotic pattern, regardless of whether it's IPF, chronic HP, or something else. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I think it's it's the etiology of the lung injury is is not. Um, it, the classifier doesn't tell you the etiology, but it does classify the pattern of the injury. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that makes me a little bit more concerned too for the patient and uh, in the progression as well. So what do we, what happens next? Uh, is that, is this our final ILD diagnosis and what's gonna be our management plan? I think as we discuss this, um, as us together as a multi-disciplinary uh, uh, team and discussion, I, to me, I think we could put the pieces of the puzzle together there and stop. What, what's your feeling? Yeah, this is an interesting issue, right? Is, is you know, when is your diagnostic confidence level enough, right? So each of those pieces of information have increased including patient's age and their, you know, symptoms and their, their um, exposures have increased your diagnostic confidence and then your Invisia classifier increased it some more. So the question is whether really, whether a surgical biopsy will sufficiently change your, your diagnostic confidence to be useful uh, or recommended in this case. And frankly- Yeah, yeah I would agree. And a guy this age, uh, you, you know you've got a fibrotic process 
do you need more? Do you need to subclassify it more? And I would say probably not. Yeah, I, I think I agree because we're, especially with the uh, recent results of the Envil study, and as we look at new data that's coming out on any fibrotics in progressive fibrotic uh, lung disease, I think I think we would have enough. And, and certainly my confidence is, is increased with all this information. Let's look a little bit further because as part of the BRAVE trial, we're lucky enough to have uh, biopsy samples to look at. And this is the patient's cryobiopsy. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Colby to take us through that and describe what he sees. Well, as I mentioned, cryobiopsies are operator dependent and you can see the two biopsies in this case on the left-hand side. There's not a micrometer there, but I can tell you that those are both about six to seven, millimeter, six to seven millimeters in greatest dimension. They don't have the crush artifact of a forceps biopsy. And you could see at the top, there's a patchy process with some white areas and some pink areas indicative of uh, normal lung or preserved lung and fibrotic lung. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the arrows pointing toward chronic fibrosis in the left or the center panel and a good fibroblast focus. So this would be a case that I would say I have a high confidence on a cryobiopsy that this is a UIP pattern. Uh, it's certainly a significant fibrosing pattern. Now, I don't see anything specifically that would point toward HP, such as granulomas or bronchiolocentricity, but their absence certainly wouldn't exclude the possibility that this could be uh, scarring related to chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So I don't think for me um, that changes what my management plan necessarily is going to be, which would be uh, using antifibrotics. Um, uh, Dr. Lynch, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's pretty clear. He has a fibrosing interstitial pneumonia, and we probably never know the underlying etiology, whether it is the exposure or whether it's UIP in the 79, IPF in the 79 year old, but probably either way, the management is clear. Right. So I, I think that. Uh, uh, leaves us all with a um, fibrotic uh, HP picture with the uh, UIP-like injury pattern and that we treat this patient ultimately with antifibrotics. So let's move on and look at case two. Is everybody ready? Yep. All ready. right. So this is a 63-year-old female, and she has a history of being a lifetime non-smoker. She presented with shortness of breath and cough and was referred to a pulmonologist to ultimately perform further workup. And of course, that included um, uh, HRCTs that we as pulmonologists uh, like to do. We need to, we need to see our images and pictures. Her past medical history was notable for a history of breast cancer and that had occurred 10 years ago and she got treated with radiation to the right breast. Um, she had an history as well of underlying depression. Occupational uh, history included really no known occupational exposure. She had no birds, no mold exposure, no hot tub use, none of the usual uh, culprits were noted in her history. Family history, was notable for a father and a mother with fibrotic ILD. She had spirometry done as well as serologies and a six minute walk test. Her FEV1 to FEC ratio was 82% with an FEC of 2.43 liters, which is 85% of predicted and an FEV1 of 1.81 liters, which is 91% of predicted. So essentially normal spirometry. Her serologies, uh, which included an ANA, anti-SCL70, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, Rowan Law, anti-JO1, and uh, were within normal limits and, and uh, she did not have an inflammatory CRP. Six minute walk test uh, noted a walk distance of 365 meters with an O2 saturation nadir of 99% on room air. So normal spirometry, she didn't desaturate significantly with her walk and, and no significant uh, rheumatologic serologies or findings. 
So Dr. Lynch, let's look at our HRCT scan. So here we are, we're gonna go through the same process as we did the last time. We uh, will go through these images. We'll first look at the technique and I will, as, as radiologists usually do, I will whine about the technique uh, because again, we don't actually have uh, thin sections here. And I think it is important for you to try and do that. This is also a, com a contrast enhanced exam. But as I say, this is what happens, retrospective study, and you often end up with these imaging. But I, I would have probably recommended a high resolution CT here. Uh, probably wouldn't have made much difference to be <laughs> Um, but um, so again, uh, it's a little similar to the last case. It's a diffuse process and you can see there's a clear component of subplural irregularity uh, and uh, patches of ground glass abnormality. Uh, the subplural predominance persists as we go through uh, the lungs in a craniocaudal direction. Again, it's more marked in the lower lungs. A couple of differences from the last case. First of all, there are subplural foci of consolidation here, um, uh, particularly in that right lower lobe, lesser extent in the left lower lobe. And really there's only minimal evidence of fibrosis. There is just really mild traction bronchiectasis. Uh, so it seems less fibrotic than that previous case, but there is still some evidence of fibrosis. Uh, I will note that there is this focal uh, subplural abnormality in the anterior right lung, sorry, trying to find it here, um, probably best seen here, uh, presumably related to radiation for her previous best breast cancer, but that's within the radiation port. It does not account for the remainder of these findings. Um, so let's just flip to the coronal images, which are always just so helpful in understanding the distribution of disease. Uh, and you can see that again, this is lower lung predominant. There is subplural reticulation. Uh, there are these small subplural patches of consolidation in the right lower lobe. And there's really quite mild traction bronchiectasis just a few dilated and distorted bronchi bilaterally. So this is a mixed a fibrosing interstitial pneumonia, but uh, with what we would call a, a, a typical distribution for UIP. But again, we're gonna have to place it in the indeterminate category because of the patches of consolidation and the uh, excessive amount of ground glass abnormality. So we're gonna wonder here, uh, again, it's going to be indeterminate. It doesn't have you know, features to strongly suggest an alternative diagnosis. But when we see those little patches of consolidation, we're thinking of, well, maybe there's a component of organizing pneumonia here, which would lead us towards, well, maybe uh, she has connective tissue disease like dermatomyositis. Maybe she has drug toxicity. Uh, maybe she has NSIP. Uh, and UIP would be uh, towards the bottom of our list, I think, here, um, because of the only the relatively minimal amount of fibrosis. David, let me ask you a question about if you look at this through the lens of a totally virgin patient, but this is a patient who has a family history of fibrosis. And with that as a background, in cases of familial fibrosis, have you seen many that show this sort of pattern? Yeah, so the, we, we know that the CT appearances of familial pulmonary fibrosis are more variable. First of all, not all of them have UIP. Some of them have other, uh, you know, have NSIP or have uh, other um, patterns. Uh, we've seen it's familial interstitial pneumonia is closer to the top of my differential when uh, it's in the upper lobes, but certainly uh, we see a lot of lower lobe uh, familial interstitial pneumonia. Of course, Lisa is at one of the world centers for that, so probably she has um, thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. It, um, in our familial patients, we may not see that exact uh, sort of classic findings, and I, I think that makes it very interesting. I think the other interesting component is that we can have uh, a mutation within a family and see multiple 
different injury patterns. Somebody has IPS, somebody has a chronic HP picture, somebody has a autoimmune um, ILD. So I think there are a lot of factors uh, around genetics and epigenetics that um, we still have yet to, to learn about these patients, but we can certainly see these more uh, atypical uh, characteristics or kind of mixed fit features. So if we look at what our possibilities are um, on our differential diagnosis list so far, we have as a team a, a possibility of drug-induced uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, we don't have a, a, a great history uh, in, in the past necessarily leading to this, but the injury is worrisome. Uh, NSIP or fibrotic NSIP, um, uh, an HP picture, um, possibly IPF, organizing pneumonia, um, ILD, or I'm going to throw in the um, familial uh, ILD or fibrotic uh, uh, interstitial pneumonia into that mix. Um, anybody leaning toward one diagnosis versus another? Um, Dr. Lynch, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if I was reading this case uh, clinically, I, I would, the thing I would um, be most suspicious of is a connective tissue disease, in fact, uh, in a, a woman of this age. Uh, but I realize that you don't really have evidence for that. And I always throw in drug toxicity and in women, you know, people sometimes forget to ask about nitrocrine too. And, and mm. I would, I would, generally just inquire specifically about that. Mm, that's a good point. Um, Dr. Colby? Well, I mean, I, I think we're solely in the indeterminate camp right now. I'm biased by that history of familial disease, but I think the question is, do we need to do something more? Yeah, we need to do something more. The question yeah, is, I'm, what suffices? Yeah, I'm, I'm with all of you. I guess I'm, I'm leaning toward a, uh, uh, NSIP type picture, or maybe this is just part of the familial uh, manifestation. You need right. to get some tissue of some kind or some sort of classifier of some kind. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I think a, a, a pure transbronchial biopsy is not probably not going to make the diagnosis here. So, so you need, uh, yeah, either the cryo biopsy if your institution. Uh, does that, which ours does not, uh, the classifier, which we are using, and we probably, you know, undoubtedly, our clinicians would use that here, uh, and then failing that is surgical biopsy. So let's see what was done next. So here's our list of what we were contemplating, uh, BAL, uh, with or without force of transbronchial biopsies and the envisiogenomic classifier, prior biopsy, or BATS. Let's look at what information we have as part of the GRAVE study. So an envisiog classifier was done as part of the GRAVE study. And interestingly, we have a positive for usual interstitial uh, pneumonia. I think that's very interesting looking at the features on the uh, HRCT, but definitely tells us there's at least gene expression for a more uh, progressive uh, fibrotic pattern of UIP. Um, Dr. Colby, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, David, uh, I, I you know, found a little bit of fibrosis on the CT scan. To me, this says, okay, that little bit of fibrosis, here's one more piece of evidence that says this is significant. And I think if you combine that with the family history, I'm th thinking this patient is just early on in a progressive fibrotic process mm -hmm. with a UIP I think pattern. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little surprising, right, in, in a woman of this age. Uh, but as you say, the, the family history is helpful. Um, and the CT is indeterminate. And, you know, the, this is the new age of uh, you know, what learning from CT, right? We, we know we've, we've carved out a lot of cases where we can make a confident diagnosis by CT uh, and are usually correct, but this is in that indeterminate category and it's 50-50 and we have to keep remembering that. 
uh, that these findings don't exclude UIP. Yeah, I think that's very true. And it's, uh, were we seeing a very early pattern of um, UIP, IPF, and maybe some acute insult on top of that with that sort of organizing pneumonia type picture and consolidation? Hard to know. Let's see what else we have. Um, so let's uh, just uh, take a little pause and summarize what we've got so far with the clinical evaluation of a 63-year-old female, shortness of breath and cough, had breast cancer about 10 years ago, radiation to the right breast, and we saw some of those limited changes that fit with that, but that didn't explain the whole uh, lung findings. Family history of chronic uh, uh, lung disease, Diffuse process on the HRCT with reticular abnormalities, ground glass opacities, and some even uh, peripheral consolidation in a few parts, moderate interlobular septal thickening, and the Invisia genomic classifier. And out of those possibilities, uh, I think that we listed with uh, NSIP, organizing pneumonia, uh, drug toxicity, UIP, IPF, or uh, a familial interstitial pneumonia. I think that leaves us with the um, latter two as a possibility with the in busy genomic classifier, making us very worried about the prognosis and um, progressive fibrosis in this patient. Uh, and I think uh, with that, maybe even able to stop there and consider treating a progressive fibrotic uh, disease at that point. Um, yeah, yeah. To me, you, you've got a patient that is atypical for IPF, a non-smoking woman, but has this history of familial interstitial lung disease. You've got a classifier that now says she does have a fibrosing process, and you could argue that, well, I'm not confident enough to treat her now, but with a follow-up three months, six months, and evidence of progression, then you wouldn't need to do any other studies uh, to put her on therapy, whether you do it now or wait, I think you have a, you've got an answer, I think you have enough of an answer here, to either manage her now or manage her later after follow-up. Yeah, I think so too. I think my main drivers are her uh, familial history and then coupled with um, uh, the genomic classifier because I know that uh, through um, the original studies and the two validation studies that they're is a very high specificity. So I'm um, less likely to have a false positive on that. Um, so let's look at the pathology. Um, Dr. Colby, what do you think about this? Well, not unreasonably in a young, non, relatively young non-smoking woman, she did have a surgical lung biopsy and there's two of them. This is the first one that shows a significant fibrosing process with active fibroblast foci. You don't see coarse honeycomb change, so it's not surprising that there's no honeycomb change based on the CT scan. Next slide. Next one, there we go. And then the second piece, and this is likely from the lower lobe, there's pretty severe fibrosis there with lots of microscopic honeycombing. Mm. And that's actually sufficient fibrosis that could conceivably even look consolidative on a CT scan. So. The surgical biopsy really confirms a more significant fibrosing process to me than was suggested by the HRCT findings alone. And the biopsy uh, sort of confirms what the classifier said. This is a UIP pattern. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's very um, interesting. It gives us a lot of detail. And I think that's interesting to point that all of these sort of honeycomb cysts are are opacified and filled um, and how that may translate into our possible radiographic findings. Um, so I think as we think about this patient, uh, that uh, we have that more fibrotic UIP pattern and I think that leans us toward a UIP IPF uh, coupled with uh, uh, under the umbrella of familial uh, fibrotic lung disease and uh, leans us toward treating them uh, probably sooner rather than later with uh, antifibrotics. So I think we've had some really good discussion today looking at these uh, two cases from the BRAVE database of uh, cases in the trial 
And uh, it sort of really helped us highlight that accurate ILD diagnosis is, is really critical to taking care of these patients and informative of our management strategy. We've got to have that. And that the Invisi classifier um, accurately detects that genomic pattern of injury of usual interstitial pneumonitis. Uh, and that we can utilize that additional tool in our toolbox of clues as we're trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together and really better understand and make a more timely and accurate diagnosis. And that specificity of 91% with a low faults um, positive rate uh, is really helpful and I think in, in critical in the use of uh, this busy classifier in understanding its utility as you apply that to patients. Um, and it's really continuing to, as we think about this as a complement to our other findings. Our history is still critical. Our physical exam is critical. Our radiographic injury patterns on HRCT are critical. And it may help us decide too whether or not we need uh, more uh, history and more tissue in the form of a lung biopsy as well too. Uh, Dr. Uh, Colby, any final thoughts? Well, it might drive me out of business a little bit, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm retired now, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lynch, anything to add? Well, uh, I, for me, uh, I, uh, it, it's, it's helpful, right? Because uh, the, these indeterminate cases are just a increasing part of our practice. And, and this is exactly where uh, this tool fits. Uh, and so I think it is going to grow in terms of its utility.